one of the the ones I think is feeling comfortable with the uncomfortable. Yep. That's been a really red thread over the last few years. So yep. being okay with feeling uncomfortable and being comfortable with that. Yep. Um, and that then again is apply, applicable in, in in everything in life, right? Uh, almost. Stand still by it. Um, which obviously has is isn't quite gives a quite direct English um, quotation. But what do you what does that mean to you? So so what it means as a as a saying in the Dutch language is that it means that you will stop, that you will hold, that you will take a moment of pause, um, and that you um, will think about things and not just run through. So it's got all of those meanings. So it means quite a number of things. Thank you, and wonderful to finally catch up with this podcast. Um, when we talked about this, doing this, you actually came up with a wonderful Dutch saying, which is "stand still by it," um, which obviously has is isn't a quite gives a quite direct English um, quotation. But what do you? What does that mean to you? So, so what it means as a as a saying in the Dutch language is that it means that you will stop that you will hold that you will take a moment of pause um and that you um will think about things and not just run through so it's got all of those meanings so it means quite a number of things and that is what it means for me and i realized particularly in the conversation we had uh, that that is something that i have always done but i've been doing that more and more throughout my career throughout my life um throughout the work that we do together in the question space so um that's where that came from and what it means is reflection, um, yep. analysis, making sure that you, you stop, you think, what's actually happening, and um, how do I how do I then do something with this once you've discovered what it is that is actually happening with you? Uh, it's such a, a really interesting skill because you know, especially when you're hired as you you do to be a problem solver, you want to solve a problem. Like, and sometimes reflecting and listening is is something you don't necessarily think of as the major part of that component and the same for coaching you know sometimes listening and reflecting isn't you 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 hardwired to want to solve it and jump in where sometimes you don't always have all the data there yeah absolutely and discovering that data either internally for yourself or externally mm. in your environment as you just said with the role that you have um it makes a massive difference um stopping Stopping also the thinking in your mind sometimes. I don't know if that goes for everybody, but yeah. definitely for me. I think we are so, um, I don't know, we, we have to, I think it's a low behavior that we feel that we have to have a response ready by the time somebody else stops talking, um, which sometimes actually really helpful when you don't. Uh, because real listening and real understanding of what somebody else is saying or what is happening in your environment whilst you're busy in your own head means that you'll miss things. Um, so yeah, so that's, it's, it's sort of that package. It means all of that. Um, and it's become more, not so much more important, but it's something that, uh, the, the, the meaning of it hasn't so much changed in life that I'm using it more, both yeah. in really small format as well as in larger format, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, it's really interesting how those sort of sayings, you know, take on a life of their own sometimes later, you know, when you, you get, get a much deeper feeling of it. And it's like, um, even when you're you're talking there because you're thinking, okay, wh what's the time? Like you got to, and, and so when you get a gist of what someone's saying, you almost want to end it there and go, right, let's, that you've made that little statement, let's move on. Um, whereas often where they finish a sentence and where they finish a thought is, is bigger than when they start it. But you're so, okay, I think I know what they're saying. Let's, what what's, where are we up to now? Okay, we need to get moving, keep going. Um, yeah, you, you do want to just let the whole conversation actually come. And it's it's a really hard skill to do. I know for myself, I find that that you don't go into that problem solving and actually just listening and, and hearing um, is is much, much, much easier to say than it is to do sometimes. So tell oh, couldn't agree more. Go on. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say then that the only other component that then is actually interesting is that sometimes the, the reflection piece comes back again, both for yourself, but also in the conversation with the other, because instead of asking a question or stepping through to the next topic, if you actually would reflect and summarize what you've heard, that actually is, again, a really useful 
I don't know, it's not so much a tool, but you know, it's a useful way to actually providing that pause and allowing yourself to absorb, but also reflect back to the other when you've actually understood and heard what they were saying. Mm. No, very much so. So so tell us about like what is your actual role at the moment in your organization? Like how how does this all said, come about for you? Yeah, no, as you said, um problem solver is an is a nice way <laughs> of, of describing it if you like as a as a big topic. Um I, I think I will describe it as that I'm I'm actually working on different um larger scale challenges, uh problems or initiatives that are enterprise wide uh, very often. And where you need to actually take an enterprise-wide approach in order to be able to deliver, solve, or uh, the right outcomes. Um, so that means that I work with a, a large variety of different people across the organization at various levels as well, uh, and in different areas, um, because we've got a large organization. I work in a research organization um, within Australia, obviously, um, which has uh, a lot of different locations across the nation. And um, yeah, my role then involves about a third of the research space that we have in the organization. So that's quite, uh, what covers it. And then um, some key elements that I quite find interesting and that actually then lead back to what we were just talking about is in order to be able to really find out what the challenge or the initiative is, you need to go back to your root cause analysis, which means that you need to reflect it and uh, make sure that you've got a real understanding of what is it actually really that we're trying to solve here and why is this an issue? Um, and then uh, secondly, to work again with people across the organization to make sure that you then solve and define what the approach actually should be. There's never one answer to it. There's also yeah. always multiple ways to get there, right? Um, how you get there though, with on a journey with people in order to yeah. make sure that it becomes an outcome that is taken up by everybody, that is sort of a core element of their own. So effectively, what I always say to people when I'm saying it in a fun way, I, <laughs> I talk a lot. I try to solve problems. <laughs> I sit a lot behind the computer and I've got a lot of conversations and I write documents. So that's, that's it in a nutshell, if you like. Actually, part, part of one of the funny stories you first told me when we first met is the, the difference between Australian language and, and obviously your culture of when your boss first is said to you, hi, how are you going? And you turned around and followed them back into their office to let them know how you're going. And I think that's a perfectly legitimate thing. Whereas obviously ours is a throwaway comment in 90% of the time that it's just, hey, going is a, is a hello. And that was all. Yes. Um, and that really struck me as a very different <laughs> connotation uh, that you expected. Well, you asked me a question, so I should follow that up. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And then the frustration and, uh, and it took me a few days uh, or a week and a half or something to actually realize that it was more like a hello uh, and not a not a real invitation to have a longer conversation about how things were going. Yeah, very, very interesting. A bit of frustration there <laughs> in the beginning, I have to say. Um, but yeah, once you once you adapt to it, it's actually quite interesting, particularly that that various cultures component, right? Because that's a, yes. a large difference between countries or between different areas in the world. You also have that culture difference at a, at a mm. smaller scale. Uh, yes. within um, workplaces, families, uh, different areas of Australia, for example. Yep. So, yeah, it's a, it's a very, a very interesting one. But, yes, I definitely had that when I arrived here. <laughs> so what would you say is a, a broad difference between cultures between that, you know, Dutchish culture to the Australian culture in the, in in a workplace setting? Um, I think there's three main ones for me. Uh, and that's clearly the way that I've experienced the Dutch culture yep. because there's, again, not just one yep. there, but that's just my experience. Um, I think the, the first one is the, the directness. So the Australian culture is, is more slightly more English, I think, in the sense yep. that um, there's, there's a polite way of softly indicating where you would like to go, whereas yep. I've learned, unless you state and put on the table what it is that you would like, how can somebody else understand where you want to go yep. or what it is that yep. you look for and ask them for, right? So, so that that's one that leads directly then to the second, in a, particularly in a work environment, um, the experience that you normally go around the table, let everybody have a say, and then people will put on the table what is that they would really like to achieve. Okay. And then yep. you can together work towards a win-win solution, right? Or a win-win outcome. Whereas um, my experience, it's, it's getting better, but my experience originally here was that sometimes the person who speaks loudest or who speaks fast 
Uh, yes. It's been very yep. easy to go with that kind of a solution. And if you come from a culture where you're used to sitting back because there will be a time and everybody will get a chance to say something, you often miss that moment because you actually don't yes. contribute. So yes. <laughs> yes. that's a second. Um, and yeah, that goes into that, that negotiation space, if you like. The, what, what kind of outcome are we looking for? And do we take the time um, and have the robust discussions, which um, is why people sometimes think that there's a lot of arguments or a lot of, um, yeah, you know, almost like, um, yeah, argumentative kind of discussions okay. yep. um, in order to actually get to an outcome, which is true because you need to have that robustness in order to get a positive outcome. Now, that then also from a whatever environment you're in means that clearly there needs to be a level of trust, there needs to be a level of sharing, <clears throat> there needs to be a level of being able to listen to each other within that concept, right? Otherwise, um, that can go off the rails as well. But yeah, those I think are the three main ones for me that cross over in, yeah, most things in life for me at least, particularly <laughs> business. Yes, yeah, yeah. And it's really interesting because if you have that trust that your voice will be heard, you don't have to 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 stomp your feet and jump up and down and and you know it's a much different environment within a, just a meeting room even um and a and a respectful way of going around rather than feeling that you have to especially if you're you know a, a quiet person by nature but you still feel that you are going to have a say and and that saying is is going to be heard you know you having to project yourself in a very different way is is quite draining for a lot of people in that way Yes, and, and particularly in the area that I work in, right, lots of researchers, they tend to be, um, I mean, it's proven, more introverted because, yes. and they therefore have more of a kind of a thinking approach, would like to see things beforehand, analyze, reflect, et cetera. Um, being an extrovert myself, uh, that's an environment that is actually quite interesting to find <laughs> your way in, if you like. Um, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so on lots of levels, but uh, really enjoyable, though, I must admit. Um, yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so with, that, with you being a little bit more of an extrovert, how do you find initially going into a room with, with introverts that you that can be very quiet and, and sometimes certainly with certain introverts, you know, hard to, to engage. Doesn't mean they don't have something to say, but they're sometimes less likely to be drawn into like you have to draw them in, in in a really trusting way to get that conversation going and to maintain it and then to let it grow from there key one is um making sure that you are prepared and making sure that you have allowed others to see things beforehand and therefore that there is it, it, you know the brainstorming environment is not always the best for that unless people yep. know it's going to be brainstorming but otherwise make sure that there's something that, that people know what you're going to talk about share documentation beforehand if you can. Um, yep. And then, yeah, I've learned along the way, making sure that when there's a silence, don't wait three seconds, but you actually give people time to reflect and you actually make sure that everybody can be comfortable with silence because yep. that's actually important. People need time to think. Um, and thirdly, making sure that you ask questions, right? It's it's real easy to then try to fill up the, the space and fill up the conversation, fill up the meeting with um solutions with approaches with suggestions whereas just ask the question and take people along on the journey yep. um and surprisingly or maybe not surprisingly but it's super enjoyable well nowadays i find that mm -hmm. um how, how, how rich the conversations can be yep if you just take the time to what we said earlier listen genuinely listen yep. and not have that feeling that you need to drive fill up um, make sure that the conversation is going because the conversation is going. It doesn't always have to be just through words. You yep. know, they, they, things will happen. So yep. yeah, listen, reflect, prepare, uh, and make sure that you position what it is that you would like um, out of the conversation or ask questions. So did you have, like in terms of that way, did you have someone that you looked up to that that really you went, oh, that's, that's a really good way of, or was that, did you evolve mostly through just watching, observing and, and doing, um, you know, how, how did it work for you 
especially as an extrovert, like silence for extroverts is is like a dagger to the heart. <laughs> so, whereas for an introvert, silence, oh, yay, thank goodness. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, I, uh, there's a few people that I've, I've, I've seen throughout the years that I've um, learned from, absolutely, yep. um, numerous ones. Um, and I think you you learn through um, through through doing and through realizing that you're actually not achieving the outcomes that you're aiming to achieve, right? Yeah. Um, so if you if you've got a conversation, I find that nowadays if if I've got a meeting or a, a, a number of people coming together to actually have a conversation about something, and I'm the one who's mainly talking, the and it reflects back to the role that I have. The point of my role is that I'm actually facilitating a process yeah. and I'm facilitating an outcome, right? So I'm not the one necessarily who's uh, coming up with exactly what we need to do. The, the yeah. whole point is that people around me um, actually find that outcome because otherwise, ultimately, I will move on to something else and they yeah. actually are still there to actually continue to work. So if it's not in, in a joint outcome, then it, it's never going to work. Yep. So when you've got those conversations that you're the only one talking, at the end of it, uh, even though it's lovely as an extrovert to have lots of <laughs> talk about, not, not the outcome that you were after. Yeah. So if you do that often enough, you you well, I reflected on that, and it's it's made me realise that um, then observing others, uh, and if you observe good facilitators, they do that right. They have lots of of, of silence uh, and yep. good questions in order to actually engage people, because that's the second component that sits with it. Just only having silence, there's a there's a limit to that as well. And yep making sure that you actually ultimately feel comfortable with it. Um, so expanding your time. And there's lots of little tricks that I've used throughout the years um, in order to then, you know, be more comfortable, count to 20 and then the next time count to 30 or, you know, there's, there's very small little things that you can do in order to yeah. not, not feel that silence so much, for example. Um, yep. Hmm. So if you feel like a room is quite stuck, what, what would you go to as an open question to get people thinking and and just participating again, what's your go to? Without obviously divulging all your secrets. <laughs> uh, it's that is so dependent on the situation. Yeah. I have to say. Um, so I make sure that when I start a meeting, that I've got three or four key questions, and I've thought about what it is that the outcome is that I would like to see at the end of the conversation. Yep. Right, and I'm. Very open about that. Very often, um, yep. Not so much, um, yeah. Particularly around the kind of questions that you ask. Make sure your question is an open question. That's a yep. almost a no-brainer, right? Um, and then when people get stuck in a conversation, you can do a couple of things. It depends on the comfort of the room and how comfortable people are with each other. But if it's a group that's been coming together um, a few times, for example, you can um, either call out. So, is there any other thoughts? Have we actually captured any everything? Yep. Uh, the other one is to preempt early in a conversation where you know this is a group that is going to be quite quiet that you're going to call out names because you would like to have input um, and then you need to make sure clearly that your questions are coming from an angle um, and, and are open enough that people can respond to it from their background because that's oh, often okay. what, yep. what I do right yep. we, we bring different areas of research together to have a conversation around for example developing a strategy uh, around health across the organization yep. and where we should go as an organization within the Australian ecosystem. Yep. So then if you bring different people together from that, um, it, who are contributing to that, you've got a wealth to talk about as long as you open up and, and get them to contribute where they think it needs to go or where they're working at the moment and which elements of what they do contribute to this kind of concept. Um, so that's really nice. And then if it really, really doesn't work, yeah. And if it really, really doesn't work, right, I'm really, um, easy in that perspective. Sometimes I just say, say, all right, so our conversation is not going at all today. <laughs> <laughs> Let's shift. Totally different topic. Let's go oh, and okay. talk about something else. Yeah, yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, being um yeah, being being human, I think it is, or 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 yeah. um I don't have all the answers. Yeah. Um not at all. So I don't feel uncomfortable putting that forward. Um because sometimes showing that to people means that it's, it's an invitation for somebody else potentially who has ideas around it to actually then bring them to the floor. So showing that you can be vulnerable 
and you don't yeah. have all the answers. Yep. Have you always Absolutely. had that or that's a growth thing for you? No, that's a growth thing. Um, that's a growth thing. I've, I've, yeah, where I felt comfortable and in private situations, I think I've had that most of my life. Yeah. Um, using utilizing that and and actually being able to do that in um, much broader, um, yeah, both in, in in more in public as well as in business or in, yep. in my day to day work. That's something that has evolved. No, that's really really interesting because that's I think that's one of the hardest things. You know, when you especially when you're going into a room where you're sort of expected to to know or to divulge or to have an answer for something to to actually show vulnerability and say you know this isn't one it's not about me it is about you guys and but also then to go i don't have all the answers in this moment either you know let's let's mix this up a little bit <laughs> that's good and i think yeah i was gonna say i think what's been really um interesting is that working in a research organization for this long um i've worked there for for quite a long time has really taught me that, you know, if, if you go into the content or if you go into the research areas, I mean, it's really humbling because yeah. I actually, I don't have the answers. I don't know. And yeah. also seeing that if you bring people together um, who are enthused and who feel like they can actually make a difference by what it is that they do, you know, um, uh, making sure that we um, work on, on stopping the, 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 the bleaching of the coral reef, for example, or, um, uh, pollution of plastic, right? The, the the passion of people, and then the out of the box mm. thinking, and the yep. number of ideas and suggestions that are coming forward, not stifling that by yep. you thinking that you need to know. Yep. Oh my God, that makes such a difference. So yeah, and and then it doesn't matter, right? Because because together we know so much more, and we can come up with yes. such better solutions than yep. any person on their own can. Yep. It, it takes a little while to to allow your ego to, and not not that you know, but we all have a, an ego of some sort, or ninety nine percent of us do. And it doesn't like feeling that you're just about to be squashed in a public, very public setting. Um, but yeah, like often the best things come from a seeming stumble or failure. If you are okay with going, well, that didn't work. Let's do this. Um, and that's, you know, I often find in, in coaching with, especially with equestrian, you go, we're going to try this. It may work. It may not. Well, the best intentions is it, it it should, but we'll get some data from it that tells us a little bit more and we can go from there. Whereas if you think of you must do this because this will work and that's the only thing possible, you've really backed yourself into an emotional corner. Very, yes. very hard. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and it's a really interesting Interesting one because it absolutely applies in the equestrian world as well. Right? Mm. Probably with any sport, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah, sport in Super general. Applies, yeah. yeah, yeah. Not that not that you'd ever get emotionally backed into a corner, obviously, ever, <laughs> because <laughs> <No>. <laughs> because you're, 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 you're way wiser than that. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> that that was the other thing. No, I think. <laughs> that was the other thing that I really loved that you talked about as saying, you know, what does this do by me? Um, and that's such a lovely little saying as well. Um, obviously, it's slightly different, um, you know, language for us, but but the, exactly what it means is 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 that of, you know, how am I reacting to this, and is that necessary? Basically, yeah, absolutely. And, and if you apply that to the equestrian world, right, you can do that to anything. Yes. Uh, we're all human. You feel pressure. So, so why? Um, yeah. You know, why, why am I reacting the way I am? Why is this doing with me what it's doing with me? Uh, which clearly, first of all, means that you need to actually recognize it. Yeah. Um, or recognize that something's happening. Um, yeah. And then you need to stand still by it. You need to reflect <laughs> and <laughs> analyze what this is before you can then have a look at. And, and work with the people around you. That's I find yeah. that so valuable. Then that's yeah. why working with you in the equestrian space is so cool because it 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 is a joint way of doing it. You both contribute. You both um, well in a, in the one on one setting here, but otherwise in a group as well. You learn from each yeah. other and you reflect and you realize from each other what what things are doing to you and to the group if you want. Yeah. Um, 
And then particularly the equestrian sport where you work with this partner as well that has four legs and <laughs> it's also supposed to then <laughs> provide a contribution. It's it's supposed to be a helpful <laughs> helpful partner sometimes. Sometimes not so much. Yeah. <laughs> so what, exactly. what would you say as a skill or as a personality trait or as a uh just a way of thinking you know serves you across you know work personal hobby sport like what's been the big thing for you that you've gone yeah i'm glad this skill i i carry with me everywhere i don't know if it's a there's a couple of things that came to mind one of the the ones i think is feeling comfortable with the uncomfortable yep that's been a really red thread over the last few years. So yeah. being okay with feeling uncomfortable and being comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, and that then, again, is apply applicable in, in, in everything in life, right? Uh, almost. Um, that mindset of um, flexibility, um, adaptation, being good with ambiguity. But to me, it all distills itself to being comfortable with the uncomfortable. Because yeah. once you can do that, and yeah. don't be wrong, not always successful with that either. But once you can <laughs> yes. do that, it's it's definitely a, a skill that you can flex, or a, like yep. a muscle that you can flex or train. Yes. Um, and the more you do that, yeah, the, the 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 less you have to block your thinking or have that non-breathing when you're doing things, or uh, feel when you come into a room that the pressure is new and it's all because of you. I mean, yeah, the more you can actually. So yeah. again, feel comfortable with the uncomfortable, the, the, the easier most things actually get. No, that's a wonderful, really wonderful one. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. So when, when you're in the depths of the desert, four-wheel driving, feeling uncomfortable, comfortable, and just being, I think that you know, those trips that you guys do is that perfect thing of preparation. But then once you're out there, then you're just in the moment and you just got to be flexible with that moment so all that preparation that you guys do and and sometimes when you first start that journey you go oh you know have i have i done everything should i do anything more you know what what could maybe happen you know it's still what, a whole series of what ifs but once you get out there and relax and go well this is it is what it is now and and just sink back into that do, do you ever feel what's what's your area like is is doing a trip like that into a re very remote area is it you know riding is it a workspace that can make you feel uncomfortable or just little bits of everything oh, it's little bits of everything and and um it comes back to that preparedness reflection and then solution and that you need to know your the be comfortable with the uncomfortable and you need to know your limits and particularly with that ball driving yeah um so you, you can so what we do is, is we really prepare, right? We've got three or four uh, reserves of literally everything you can think about in a car that you might need. We've yep. got fuel, um, where, where, where we've got a, a long range tank, but then we have an additional eight liters as a minimum. We've got enough water and enough food to last at least two to three weeks. So, so we're really, really well prepared. Yep. Um, so if there's an issue with the, the car or there's an issue with, uh, you know, mechanics or um, we get stuck, we're, we're prepared. Now, yep. you always have the unforeseen, right? There's things that will happen or that could happen that you could not, yep. you can't actually prevent. That's the cool part of it as well, because it is an adventure. Yep. Um, however, it's a very <laughs> well prepared and, and an adventure with uh, a low level of risk from a, yep. we can do anything if something goes wrong, whereas going through the Simpson Desert for a number of days where you don't see anybody for a little while, uh, that's clearly for some high level of this, right? And if you go and do that for driving, for example, what then becomes really important is that you need to know your limits. So yep. um, I have, the, the, I come from the Netherlands, right? So the Netherlands is a very flat country. There's yep. uh, two or three uh, roads that are uh, not tarmac um, <laughs> that you can call off roads <laughs> in the whole country. So it's not really something that, that exists. <laughs> so I've learned how to four drive or, or drive four drive in this country. Yep. And yeah, the biggest lesson that I've learned from that, which applies wherever you go, know your limit. So if you don't know, make sure that you share that. So don't yep. don't push yourself, um, yep. particularly in a situation where if something goes pitch, if that it's not the right area to actually experience that or to learn that. And it's a bit similar 
the link back to the question is then if you work with a really young horse, right, you would not push that as much as you would push your horse that you've been working with for 10 years. Yeah. Um, just because you know your team's limit, whereas when you work with a new horse, you, you don't. So that's the same with driving. So if you feel you like to go 100 kilometers an hour, but you don't feel comfortable <laughs> going faster than 80, go 80, because that's your yeah. limit. Yeah, no, that's, and that, that's where they always say you always fall back to your proficiency of competency. Like, you know, if, if something goes wrong, then that's where you find out where you're actually competent at. Um, and that's always, and it doesn't matter, you know, they talk a lot about when, um, in paragliding, when people were first able to use radio to communicate with pilots in the air, and they thought, oh, I'll be able to get them to do things that they weren't competent to do because I can talk them through it. But you still reach a point where their level of skill hits the wall they can't follow on you know their thinking can't keep up with what's being told to them anyway um so you you're always then going to fall back to that stage if if then something goes wrong at that point it's going to come back to that level of competency that they're actually able to handle or do you know in an unconscious way so that it's really interesting as a coach it's really interesting seeing especially when you're progressing as you said progressing someone's skills you know, that they realize that this is going into their conscious thoughts, which means everything slows down, everything moves a little slower because you're just trying to think things, you, nothing is is natural in that point until it becomes an unconscious skill again and then things speed up and off you go again. Yes. And, and well, we've worked on that. You, you've taught me that or shown me how that works in our um, partnership with, with the horse. It's amazing once you can then actually notice that yourself, yourself. Mm. Uh, and then once you've learned that, seeing it in others and applying it yourself, mm. it's been actually uh, really useful because you can apply it anywhere. Uh, yes, yes. It's, it's almost like the neural pathways, right? Um, we know from a scientific perspective that we need to develop neural pathways. And when you do something for the first time, your body sometimes can't do it. <laughs> um, but then once you go up on those levels, um, yeah. you know, it, it becomes almost a routine and you don't even have to think about it anymore. It's it's a little bit like that. Um, and yeah. then indeed, as you say, not falling back again to the lowest level, but actually making sure yeah. that you've got that base level that keeps going up. Yeah. Even like when you um, were upping your fitness, like with PT, like some of that technical moves that you've got to do with your strength training, you think, oh yeah, that's, you just pick the weight up or you just do the thing. And, you know, surely that's obvious to everyone. And yet once you go into the nitty gritty of, of a skill, like I know, you know, from injuries, um, I've been doing a lot more running and stuff lately. And so my running coach has taken me back to all the subgroups of muscles that, you know, go into actually running and you go like as a kid, you just run. Whereas now you go, oh my God, that hurts. This hurts that I never used that muscle before. Or I haven't used it in a very long time to try and get, you know, the technique to flow. And then, you know, six weeks later, something starts to improve and 12 weeks later, it starts to improve more. And then suddenly it starts to become your natural and, you know, you're, you're pounding the roads, not like a, a Neanderthal and something a little bit different. <laughs> Do you find with that as well then that you have, because um, that's what I found, that you have your physical blockages up there or limits mm. that you need to move? You also have mental limits that you need to move or mm. that you would like to move clearly because you want to achieve something. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, and that they, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's usually why we do things, right? <laughs> and that, that you need to, you need to actually, you can have a blockage on either of them or on both yeah. of them, but that, that they both play quite a, an interesting role. But sometimes there, your mind just, you know, you can do it, but mm, your mind just goes, no. Nah. Oh, yeah. Uh, there was two really interesting things I had. Um, one was, and it was it was a podcast somewhere quite a little while ago, and it talked about how, you know, the modern athlete is operating, you know, at 99%, you know, 100% of capacity. And he said it took people ages for most people, most high-end athletes to go past that 80% because the barrier that – the brain has a natural barrier at 70, 80%. If you're free microsurgery and all the amazing things that we can do for rehabilitation in terms of an injury, the brain is trying to stop your body from being injured. Like, because if you're injured, then there's a real problem in life. 
whereas now because if if you do an injury now that would have sidelined something for 12 months or even stopped their whole career sometimes now they're only out of the sport for you know six weeks 12 weeks um because of what they can do with surgery so it's getting the brain to accept that the body is capable and letting them obviously train to that level and the more they train to that level the stronger and and the less injury they're going to be anyway but that whole thing of you know, the brain has an inbuilt capacity to go you know you're you're getting towards 70 80 percent of what's possible don't do more than that like that's that's the injury zone like that's that's where it all goes horribly wrong and and then another time where um coming coming this is one of those funny things of where you're coming back from an injury and and so i was doing um you know water rehab and the physio said to me you know just do bicycle moment you know in the water with my legs I'm like, oh, okay that sounds fun huh? she goes now go reverse and my brain could hear what she said i could pitch what she was saying i could not make my body do it like at i could just the body just went shut down no i'm giving up on this not doing it like it's and it took me i was in fits of giggles but it, it took me probably two or three minutes to slowly get my body it had just so disengaged from you know the brain pathways to actually do from a thought to an action uh, it could do the forward it could not picture going the other way at all like it was so weird so weird i'm so with you we've had it in the writing right i call it out now yes yeah. Yeah, i yeah. know what you're asking me to do my body's not <laughs> doing it. it's just not working whatsoever but i can't translate it to yeah but i, but I, I, love, I love when you say that because other people go no i did it no you didn't like that's not and no. especially like we talked about before like you're you're in a in a conversation with a, another partner who's going no you didn't do that like that's not what you did at all but your brain can go either i think i'm doing it or i have no idea whether i did or not but you know what we think we're doing with our body language sometimes and what we're actually doing or our body dynamics is is vastly different and then you add in you know that muscle of decision making and understanding where you are what's next and all that as well like that that leads to a lot of blocks in that situation yes amazing amount of blocks and that's where it's beautiful to work with a horse right because mm. you can do it with people as well but it is harder because we've learned to be social with each other whereas a horse is just absolutely going to show you what it's showing you yeah. um so i've done that recently with, well with the jumping for example and then suddenly he can jump it. And then sometimes you can't realize just yet what it is that you've done or easily repeat what you did. Mm. But with repeated exercises, coaching, um, support, you actually can get there so you can actually do it yourself. Because yeah. they they don't, well, they show you usually instantly. And if you don't, <laughs> don't do it. They show you too. <laughs> I'm thinking of the defensive riding, right? And if you ride very defensive. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Starts, and goes, even, yeah. <laughs> even when you you're saying oh, i think i want it no i don't like the the unconscious yeah because your, your body easy. language is saying to him no don't do it whereas your your brain's going i think we sort of can um yeah no that's a it's a really funny and then i, I think as we've talked about it certainly talk with a lot of people of you know the horse is going to interpret what suits them then at that point like if if they're a very forward thinking horse and you've got an aid that is slightly forward thing, they'll go, okay, let's just go forward. If you're if you're not a forward thinking horse and there's no aid to go forward, even if the brain's thinking forward, they go, thanks for playing that game, but no thanks. Yeah. And then, you, and then you're just left standing in the middle of the ring with nothing to do. <laughs> yeah, it's funny though. Because yeah, because your reflection can be indeed, how come we stopped? Because yeah. didn't I say, but yeah, no, absolutely. That's and that, cool, actually. It's yeah. Very and that that's very much that whole, you know, what what you have planned has got to be totally adaptable. The, your partner's going, not today. This is, we're not going to work on this. Doesn't matter. You know, at the end of the day, they are 600 kilos and you are simply not. Um, and so you've got to yeah. take that on board. Absolutely. That's that flexibility. And you've <laughs> got it with people, with horses in this case because that's the sport we do as well as with yourself yep so um something that you can i don't know 
can be part of your everyday. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's always an interesting point though, isn't it? Though, like being open-minded, flexible, and yet decisive, like those are yeah. sometimes very three very different ingredients, very, very different. You know, and you can sprinkle a little bit here and sprinkle a little bit there, um, but to stay open-minded and really take on board data that information that's coming to you be flexible with that data as appropriate not too narrow-minded and yet to be decisive you know sometimes those two things are not what you need you know what I mean like it, it can be this doesn't mean it's not possible but you know that can cloud your judgment that can stop you from making the decision or stop you making the action you know to moving forward and I guess do you find that's uh, through repetition of training, through um, through understanding what is needed, is that like we, you know where where is this decision taking me? Is that where you'd feel that's the important part of keeping those three ingredients you know, mixing together well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so knowing where you're comfortable with how much information you need in order to be able to make a decision, right? So. Um, uh, a perfect is very often the enemy of good. So, mm -hmm. so where where does your uh, your balance lay in that piece? If, if yep. you've got all the data, you usually have taken way too much time, and so the decision has been made for you because you waited <laughs> yep. too long. Yes. Whereas if you have no data, then that's not going to be good either. So, so where's where's the balance? Yep. And realizing again with that being comfortable with the uncomfortable, um, being comfortable with making mistakes, and then if you call out quickly when you've made a decision that actually wasn't the right decision. And that means that you can still re-steer the ship. And that goes for all three of the examples that we've mentioned again, right? Because if you're riding a horse and you've actually made a decision, but you're quick enough to realize that you've made the wrong decision, you follow through on how you change it, you very often can save it together. Yep. And yep. that's the same goes when you work with people. Um, if, if you then decided, well, we're going this direction, and two days later you notice that's actually the wrong direction, change it. Don't yep. wait, change it. And and be uh, depending on the situation and how appropriate yeah, yeah. it is, but be open about it and share mm. that with people. Go, hey, yeah, no, yesterday we said we were going this way. Now we know this, and we're going actually this way. As long as you do it like that, usually, generally, people will come on board with you. Yeah, because you're showing. I think, especially for people, you're showing in the intention is we're trying to do this, and we we've made a decision to do it in that way, and then we've realised either there's more data come on board. Or what we were trying to do was we've come out about it at the wrong way, you know. And so the intention is still, you know, this is the track we're trying to do. And then that's the same. Exactly. And I find that the same with uh, you probably see with you know when you're talking with people in a in a individual way that is so important to go. This is this is what we're trying to do. This is why we're trying to do it, and and this is the outcome that we're looking to do. Okay, that happened. However, what we've realized is one of the foundational skills aren't there. So we have to go back, lay that a little bit better. Then we're going to try that again, or, or we're actually going to come at it from a different way. And I guess that's probably what we're talking about before of you don't get emotionally trapped into hanging your hat on, this must work, otherwise I'm a complete failure. Exactly, exactly. Because there's not things define you, but only those things that you let define you. Right, I know that that's a really lovely way to say, but oh yeah, it's no, it's beautiful. True. Yeah, yeah, totally, and totally. As long as you apply yeah. this to yourself as well, right? Yeah. If you make a decision about something in your life and then you notice it's not, not working for you, change it. Um, because the only person that's then going to hold you back in all of these situations is you, if you don't. Yeah. So, no, totally. um, Love and it. then we black with that with that flexibility piece, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just be flexible. <laughs> yeah. No, that's and that's not always easy. Don't get me wrong. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. Yes. Yeah. And because but, you, you do have, you know, part of being determined is a little bit of being a little rigid with certain things, but then still understanding what's happening around you allows, you know, flexibility to, to change or, or to step a little bit one way. You know, it doesn't have to be a complete, you know, 90 degree, 180 degree turn, but just step around some things that don't, I think one of the biggest things is, you know, does this matter now? If it doesn't matter now, you don't have to solve it now. Like there are certain things that you go, I need to address that, but other things you go, 
that's not necessary for now and that only weighs me down yeah so don't yeah just leave it yeah, absolutely yeah. and and don't feel i mean that's what i'm learning more and more in life i'm i'm i don't know we change right we learn things the more we know we know that we don't know for example and then <laughs> yeah again be, be okay with that so yeah i might have said something like four years ago that i said it's absolutely x well today i know that it's actually not so okay fair enough <laughs> <laughs> i've learned well, I've, I've, I've changed my thinking because of the experience yeah. that we've had in life and, uh, and and therefore um be kind allow that for others as well right mm. um i think that really helps as well so yeah you're you're not you're not you're not going one way nobody else is so yeah um recent reflection that is, that is a really interesting as well, things. yeah no that's a really interesting point because sometimes you come across people that you mightn't have you, you found really difficult you know two three four five years ago but unless you're open to seeing is that person the same now you've already prejudged them again um and and you haven't allowed them to go yeah they they've actually gone through some growth as well and if they haven't well they haven't Absolutely. but that's fine well and the realization that most people that you work with that you are around actually are contributing to do their best to provide the best outcome to provide the best contribution to there's not a lot of people in the world that are on purpose going in to actually not make it the best outcome it might not be the outcome that you were looking for or it doesn't align exactly <laughs> where you thought you need to go. But that part of it, once you realize that, I find that, an, a, yeah. I don't know, a revelation if you like. Because once you know that, then it's that listening again and being open-minded and um, being flexible. Um, because if we all want the best, we just then need to work on, so what does the best actually mean? Yes. What does that yeah. mean for all of us? And then once you've got a common purpose or a common view or a common way, way where you want to go, it actually becomes a lot easier again. It's a, uh, it's, you know, it's all these oh, my lessons right then. <laughs> the things you learn during your life. <laughs> but I, I find that as well, like, like, because you know, as you know, I do a little bit of blog every now and then, and I find that gives my thoughts a lot more clarity. And sometimes when you're writing things down after you've and you mull them over for a little bit, like so, so sometimes I'll write five, six, seven, eight dot points and go, I just want to put that on paper and then I'll expand that a little bit the next day or two days later. And then a week later I go, no, oh, that's no, that's not what I meant at all. That's okay. Okay. That's yes. That's the thing that's, you know, and it just gives you that little bit of clarity like that. Absolutely. Percolating it. Absolutely. Uh, letting it mull around. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Very recognizable. Yes. <laughs> yes. Time to, time to think. Uh, time to yeah um and then either through writing it down or having lots of conversation around it yeah or, uh, and then you'll, you'll, yeah you'll land somewhere um yeah. and then you'll amend it again right that's what <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> and that's which is sort of what you're saying earlier about you know sometimes brainstorming isn't the best way you know sometimes it can get something started but it's actually it shouldn't be the decisions come out of those sessions unless it's absolutely necessary because sometimes it's a week later that actually people have gone away and thought about it a little bit more and had a deeper thought and wrestle with a context of something that actually that's when it comes about. And that's the same for, yeah. you know, writing and anything that like that, you know, sometimes in the moment you feel battered down by something, yet when you reflect on it, you think actually that in itself might work, but the skill I showed being able to stay uncomfortable in that situation, not run away from it, not hide, those skills uh, serve me better in the long run. And I, I was able to reset my thoughts. Maybe I couldn't get the best out of that moment, but I wasn't deteriorating in that moment either. Absolutely. It's just as simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> So as, as a le leaving thought, what would you say in all those ingredients that we've talked about, all those thoughts, all those passions that you have for different things, how do you stay open? How do you stay enthusiastic? 
by allowing myself time to be in the here and the now um, to reflect um, and yeah, uh, which which I do by riding horses, which I do through having engagements with people um, at work or um, you know having a glass of wine with somebody, or by going into the desert for a number of days and not actually seeing anybody apart from my partner. So <laughs> taking that taking that time to yeah. yeah, I don't know, it's not so much the reflection, but the, the mindfulness, the being in the here and the now, and allowing yourself to just be um, and find find those things that actually bring you that. Yeah, because um, that's important for me, and that's how I get my energy where I can recharge. Um, and and knowing from yourself, or or having an understanding of how you work, and what it is that you need in order to be able to recharge, because that's yeah. the other one. Because different people have that in such yeah. different ways. Yeah, yeah, totally. Those You've are really the ways know. that, that yeah. go for me. Mm. Yeah. So no, knowing yourself, what gives you recharge? So, yeah, that's perfect. That's yeah. lovely. Because sometimes we get lost of what we think. Is our recharge and what actually works for us and that especially that i can't emphasize that enough as you said like being actually in the moment as well like, because sometimes we put the the time aside and go this is what gives me recharge but we don't go into that moment and so then it, it's wasted as well so i no, totally love that really love yes. it <laughs> thank you so much for doing today i really appreciate it you're very welcome. <laughs> and uh, yeah, <laughs> looking forward to our next conversation. <laughs> Take Sounds care. Good. Thank you.